Okay, so welcome to chapter three. We are going to be discussing the solo growth model. So, first, what's the point of this model? Well, the point of this model in terms of this class is to give you a nice sort of early introduction into some dynamic models confronting or addressing, really, economic growth and development. Now, as far as the motivation of this model, well, it's actually a pretty simple one. And it is the fact that we've been seeing growth in real GDP across the world for decades, I mean centuries, really. But while we've been seeing growth on average across the world for centuries, some countries have grown a lot, other countries really haven't grown very much. Some countries have actually grown backwards, like Haiti after the earthquake in I believe 2010, 2011, something like that. So we've been seeing that there are variances across growth in real GDP spread out by these different countries over time. And this model sort of sets to address some of those questions. I believe it was developed first in either 1956 or 1958. It kind of sat on the shelf for a while, but eventually it got picked up uh, from a lot of other neoclassical economists who eventually took some of the framework of the solo model and put it into their own models, which has sort of allowed the basic framework of this model to sort of carry on through a majority of macroeconomic modeling. So let's talk about the setup of the model. So I believe this is section 3.3 in the text. Now the point here is to find a way to describe the whole economy. I'm probably thinking that sounds like a lot. But it's actually rather simple. It's almost incredibly simple. If you remember from principles of macro, GDP was expressed by output, Y, equals the way GDP can be consumed. So we've got production on this side. We can say production equals expenditures. When we produce y, we can split y up according to this equation right here three different ways. We can split it up by either consuming, investing, or allowing the government to tax all of our money away and then spend it as they see fit. I mean, not all of our money, but you get the joke, or the gist. We won't call it a joke, we'll call it a gist. Good save, Jeremy. So, if we've got all of these things, well, we can describe actually every sector of the economy at the aggregate level just by looking at this equation right here. Now, in the solo growth model, what it does is it assumes there is no government. So output is split up solely by consumption or investment. So whatever you consume is, you know, you, go out, you buy a TV, you want to go buy a new car or something like that, that's consumption. If you want to invest, the way that works is rather than buying consumer goods, you're buying investment goods, you're saving. So you can either consume or you can save. So household or output, we'll say, is split between consumption and investment. You can either consume or you can invest. You can consume or you can save. Now, this is where the household comes into play. What the solo model assumes is that they exist they're not explicitly modeled.
In more mathematical terms, what that means is households are assumed to exist, but there is no equation for them. If there's no equation for them, well, they're not going to be showing up in this mathematical framework. All we know is that they consume a constant fraction s that's contained within the closed interval of 0 and 1, and they spend a fraction 1 minus s, which would also be contained within the 0, 1 interval. But firms, on the other hand, we have a little bit more information about them. We know firms exist, and we also know what their production function is. We know that they make stuff. They make stuff to be able to sell. And I'm going to say all firms are the same. They have access to the same technology, they produce the same final consumer good, and um, they have two inputs, capital and labor. Capital is denoted K sub T. Labor is L sub T. But there's another input in their production function that we see here. We've got capital K, we've got labor L, but we've got this A thing, All right? And what the hell is this A thing? Well, this is the source of technology shocks, which we'll be talking about once we actually address what the functional form of this production function is going to be. which is this right here. We've got y equals at times kt to the alpha times lt to the 1 minus alpha. This alpha is going to be contained within the open interval of 0 and 1. So now, basically, we've got these exponents, alpha and 1 minus alpha. Notice we've got alpha here, 1 minus alpha here. So if we were to sum up these exponents, we get 1, which is a very important thing here. This implies what's known as constant returns to scale, which means if you doubled the inputs, if you doubled the amount of capital and labor that you use, you will exactly double the outputs. 
If you had decreasing returns to scale, if you doubled the inputs, you would less than double the outputs. And if you had increasing returns to scale, if you doubled the inputs, you would more than double the outputs. So now let's move on and talk about what that A term is. So what is AT? Well, like I said earlier, it's technology shock, which probably doesn't mean very much right now. Another way to think of it is a shifter. AT is assumed to be one if there is no growth. steady output. Right, so if output's just being output, it is just doing the output thing, it's not increasing, it's not decreasing, at least as a result of any sort of exogenous or outside forces, A is equal to 1. Now if A is larger than 1, we get growth. If we were to graph this guy, I'm going to graph it in terms of labor. Actually, I'll do it in terms of capital instead, for reasons we will see shortly. So I've got output as a function of capital. So what we're doing is when we're looking at this, right, we're not assuming <clears throat> there isn't any labor in this production function. Rather, what we're doing is we're only looking down one particular axis, right? We're only concerned about how capital is affecting output. This is kind of a three-dimensional function. So what would be happening is, if we started right here, this line coming out in this direction would be labor. So if we stare directly down the L axis, right? So instead of seeing like, like a graph that looks kind of like this, we eventually rotate it. So you're staring down the L axis. All you see is K and Y. And when we do that, say so we'll have AT, we'll call it prime here, times KT to the alpha times LT to the one minus alpha. Now, if there is a technology shock, this entire curve shifts up. Like this. Now, I didn't square AT. That's just sort of a superscript indicating that it is not the first AT, but rather the second one. So there was a shift. There's some sort of technology shock where A was larger than 1. A increases, and what it does is it shifts this production function up. But notice, when I drew that shift, the production function still starts at the origin. All right, it starts at the origin for a very specific reason. And that has to do with the assumptions of the setup for this model. First, production takes only non-negative arguments. Which means KT has to be greater than or equal to zero. LT has to be greater than or equal to zero. 
So we can have anything that's zero or higher, but we can't have anything negative. In addition, we have the anodic conditions. The first and a condition is that the limit as your input capital approaches infinity of the production function's first derivative with respect to capital approaches zero. The same thing holds for labor. Only for labor, as the labor input approaches infinity, its first derivative with respect to labor will also approach zero. Oops. I made a mistake. No, I didn't. But we also have here is that the limit as capital and labor approach zero, the partials of the production function with respect to labor, or capital and labor, as the capital and labor inputs approach zero, they approach infinity. These will help ensure that the starting point is zero. And if you don't believe me, well, we can also try this. Just take this guy, plug zero in either for K or L, and see what happens. If you plug zero in for K, 0 to the alpha times L to the 1 minus alpha. Well, see what happens. Now another assumption here is that the function is increasing everywhere. What does this mean? Well, it means that when we draw that graph, let me redraw it really quickly. We look at this graphed out in terms of capital, or if we look at it graphed out in terms of labor, the slope is always positive. Wherever we are for any non-negative inputs of capital and labor, the slope will always, always, always be positive. That means if we add a little bit more capital, production is going to increase a little bit more. If we add a little bit more labor, production is going to increase a little bit more. Well, how do we look at that mathematically? Well, the way that we look at it mathematically is...
that the derivatives of the production function with respect to kt and lt are always going to be positive. We'll suppress the at term for a moment and look only at k and l. So the partial derivative of y with respect to kt, remember we take the exponent and multiply it by the leading coefficient of that variable and then subtract 1 from that exponent. And then anything that's not k is along for the ride. It's treated as constant. So this is the partial derivative of the production function y with respect to capital. So I've got this little squiggly d y over the little squiggly d kt. All right, in calc 3, it's usually referred to as like a del, like del y del kt, or the partial of y with respect to k. And we assume that this guy is positive for all inputs k. So this upside down a means for all. Or for every. It's just a fancy way of saying that without writing this. A lot easier to write than that, at least I think. And it looks cooler and it makes you look smarter, which, you know, for economists, we love to always try to find ways to look smarter than everybody else. And it's same for mathematicians, actually, because we kind of took this for math. But we love to try to find ways to look smarter than everybody else, so that way we can get them to, you know, give us more money whenever we get a job. So we assume that this derivative is positive, which means the slope of the production function with respect to k so the slope along the k-axis is always going to be positive, which means the slope, oh, oh god, that looks really bad. Jeez, I just realized how bad that looks. Um, so the slope is always going to be positive no matter where you are. It will eventually begin to level out, but it never hits zero, and it never goes negative. Because if it were to go negative, what that would mean is as we're adding more capital, output is falling. So if we add one more unit of capital, we lose some amount of y, which doesn't really make much sense. And the same thing holds for labor. So if you take this derivative, the derivative of this guy here with respect to L, right, this exponent becomes a leading coefficient times kt to the alpha. Remember, there's no change in k when we're looking at the partial derivative with respect to l. But there is a change in l. All right, because k is assumed to be held constant here because k isn't changing. Change in y over change in l. Well, k is assumed constant. So there's no change in k, so this derivative here with respect to k, nothing happens. But here, with respect to l, we subtract 1 from 1 minus alpha, which just gives us minus alpha. And this is also assumed to be greater than 0. If you add more labor to production, you will never lose production. You will get more production all the time. So that sounds pretty cool. It sounds like we go, all right, awesome. We can just keep adding more inputs and we'll always get more outputs, which is true. You will. But there's a catch. And that catch is rather simple. This production function is what's known as twice k 
continuously differentiable. Fancy way of saying second derivative exists. So when we take the second derivatives of this function here, what we do is we take this derivative and we just take another derivative of it. What's that going to tell me? Well, the first derivative gives us the slope. Is the rate of change. So if the first derivative of a position function, which this is a position function, this is telling us the position of production given the inputs of capital and labor, the first derivative of that is going to give us the rate of change. So if I were to increase k or increase l by some tiny minuscule amount, that's going to tell me how much output's going to change. But if I want the second derivative, that's going to give me the rate of change of the rate of change. What is that? What is the rate of change of the rate of change? Well, it's the acceleration. So the first derivative will give me, say, miles per hour, if we're looking at how fast some thing, some object, is moving over time. It'll give me miles per hour if I get the first derivative of the position of that object moving over time. The second derivative is going to tell me how fast that slope is changing. It's going to give me acceleration. Well, what does that mean here? Well, let's see. Let's see if we can take the second derivative of the production function with respect to capital. What's that going to give me? Okay, well, I take this alpha minus 1 and I multiply it by alpha. So I'll have alpha times alpha minus 1 kt to the alpha minus 1 minus 1, which is alpha minus 2, times LT to the 1 minus alpha. Right, because L still doesn't change here. All right, so if I look at this guy, we want to figure out what the sign is. Is this guy going to be positive or negative? Well, let's take a look. Okay, so let's look here. Remember, oops, alpha was assumed to be less than one, but greater than zero. So it could seem a little abstract, so let's assume alpha is one half for a moment. Let's let alpha be one half. All right, well, if I do that, being sloppy here. Well, what I get is 1 half times 1 half minus 1 times kt to the 1 half minus 2 times lt to the 1 half. Let's simplify this a little bit further. What's 1 half times 1 half? Well, that's 1 fourth minus 1 half times 1. Well, that's 1 half. So 1 fourth minus 1 half times kt to the 1 half minus 2. Well, it's 1 half minus 2. It's negative 3 over 2, I believe. Times l to the 1 half. 
right? Now, the inputs of K and L are always positive. So since these guys are always positive, right, these exponents here, the exponent's negative, it really just means that it's being, it's dividing LT. So we're not going to worry about this K and L, we're not going to worry about these exponents because that's not going to be changing the sign of this particular function here. But this leading coefficient, on the other hand, is going to tell us what the sign is. What's one half or one fourth minus one half? Well, one fourth minus two fourths times kt to the minus third of two times lt to the one over two. Well, I got one fourth minus two fourths. What does this come out to? Well, one fourth minus two fourths is negative one fourth. Oh, wow. Okay. That means that that thing is negative. So the second derivative of the production function with respect to capital is negative. I'll write that there and I will erase the stuff directly underneath. And the nice thing about teaching online rather than teaching in class is since I'm making a video, I don't ever have to worry if anybody's gotten it written down yet because you can always push pause. Now let's look at the second derivative of production with respect to labor. Oh, I have negative alpha, one minus alpha times kt to the alpha times lt to the negative alpha minus one. Well, remember, just like earlier with the derivative of the production function with respect to capital, Alpha was less than 1, but it was greater than 0. So it's some fraction between 0 and 1. So the negative of a positive number times 1 minus that positive number, which is less than 1, automatically tells me, oh yeah, this is also less than 0. So the first derivatives are positive, the second derivatives are negative. What does that mean? Well, it tells me that the production function is concave. We've got a positive first derivative and a negative second derivative. <clears throat> In English, English time with Jeremy. Y is increasing, but it's increasing at a decreasing rate. Which means it's doing this. So Y is always going to be going up, but the rate at which Y is going up is slowing as we increase either capital or if we increase labor.
which means we have diminishing marginal products of capital and labor. We can keep adding more capital and output will always increase, but the amount output increases is going to slow. Let's see what that looks like on a graph. I'm going to clear up some more room here. And I'm kind of flying through the calculus because for this chapter, for this model, you aren't going to need to know how to take any derivatives. So I'm going to look at output as a function of capital. Now, if I were to take the derivative of this sucker with respect to capital and evaluate it, we'll call it KT0. So I've got some input of capital, which directly corresponds to some output of output. And if I were to take the derivative, I wanted to see what the rate of change was at this particular point I would have this tangent line. And the slope of this tangent line is going to be positive wherever we go. But let's assume I increase the capital stock to K1. Well, it's going to correspond to some level of output y1, but the difference, if we look, this slope is a lot shallower than that slope. So the rate at which output changes, if we add more capital here, it's relatively steep. The rate at which it changes here is a lot more shallow. And as we get further and further out, it gets more and more shallow. That's what's known as a diminishing marginal product of capital. Because the first derivative of this with respect to capital is what's known as the marginal product of capital. How much more output do we get if we add one more unit of capital? The derivative of this with respect to labor is the marginal product of labor. How much more labor, how much more output do we get if we add one more unit of labor, one more labor hour, one more worker, however you'd like to measure it? So the first derivative of y, and this little wrt, which is with respect to, first derivative of y with respect to k is the marginal derivative, or the marginal product of capital. We don't suppress the a term. Give me that. It's the marginal product labor then. Oh, del y, del l. It's just that.
how much more output Y do I get if I add one more unit of capital? Marginal product of capital tells me that. How much more output Y do I get if I add one more unit of labor? Marginal product of labor tells me that. Let's cover a few more assumptions of this model. Goods and factor markets are competitive. So if we've got competitive markets in the output market, Y, Y is sold in a competitive market, which means price is equal to marginal cost. Factor markets, inputs of capital and labor, right? Their factor prices are equal to the marginal products of capital and labor. So there's no economic profit being extracted here. It's zero economic profit. No one has any market power. No single firm has market power. Why don't why don't any single firms have market power? Well, they're all the same. They're all identical. Model solved is if we are what's known as a benevolent social planner. Basically, we're God. We have all available information. We know everything that is going to be done. We've got perfect and complete information on how the market is going to clear. So we know there is some price that clears the market. So we solve by basically figuring out what the optimal quantities of the input factors are, K and L, to achieve a competitive equilibrium. Basically, we're solving it as if we're God. Now, I know I said, since we knew households existed, but there wasn't an objective function, there wasn't a utility function for that household, they weren't explicitly in the model. And that's true. I wasn't lying to you about that. But there are still decisions that have to be made, yet they're made exogenously from the model. So households still have to choose whether they want to consume or invest, or consume or save. Saving is equal to investment. Savings equals investment in this model. Why? Because it's a closed economy. In a closed economy, savings equals investment. So you have a constant fraction S of output. Output equals.
was income. So output equals income then what that means is the constant fraction s of output is saved, the constant fraction s of income is saved. So savings is equal to s times output, yt. That's how much of output is being saved. The next question. Is there a way to model investment? Answer? Yes. There it is. So what is investment? Well, like I said, investment is saving, right? But there's something going on with investment that needs to be looked at. It needs to be considered that's not just, well, how much do we want to save? If you save, you invest. If you invest, you buy capital. Therefore, if you save, you buy capital. But there's something tricky here. Capital is what's known as a state variable. state variable defines the state of the system at time t. So capital, we'll call it kt, capital today is a state variable. But this means capital Today, today's capital stock can't be changed today. However, we can change tomorrow's. Today. So KT, current capital, is a state variable, can't be changed today. KT plus one, on the other hand, is a choice variable. We can choose what tomorrow's capital stock is going to be today. Think about this with firms. When you work in a company, let's say you work for a restaurant, because I've worked in restaurants for like years before I actually came to graduate school. When you work in a restaurant, they've got labor and they have capital. Right? The capital would be like the grills, the fry machine, stuff like that. Well, if you're in the middle of a dinner rush and you decide you need a new grill or you need a second grill, you're not getting that grill today. It's gonna be a while before it actually gets installed. So that amount of time that you have to wait to get that thing installed is basically defined by the fact that that grill is a state variable. The grill you currently have is a state variable. You've already made that choice. 
You want the second grill, awesome, you're gonna have to wait a little while to get it. You can't just get it immediately. So if you want to get a new grill while you're investing, and you're purchasing that grill, which will be delivered, let's just say it's gonna be delivered tomorrow. So in the middle of your dinner rush, that new grill's not gonna help you one bit. But in tomorrow's dinner rush, it's definitely gonna help you. Now, today's capital and tomorrow's capital are related via what's known as the law of motion of capital. And what the law of motion of capital says is that investment is equal to the flow of capital over time. Tomorrow's capital minus this one minus delta times today's capital. So what's one minus delta? Well, let's talk about what delta is first. Delta is the depreciation rate of capital. Delta is within zero or the zero one interval. It's a closed zero one interval. So since it's the depreciation rate, if delta is zero, there's no depreciation. If delta is 0.5, half of your capital stock every period falls apart and needs to be replaced. Delta is equal to one. Well, that's kind of the worst of all scenarios where when delta is equal to one, it means all of your capital stock is falling apart every single period. So if delta is the depreciation rate, how much capital falls apart? One minus delta is the amount of capital left over each period. So one minus delta tells me how much capital from today is going to exist tomorrow. So if the depreciation rate is positive, that means some amount of tomorrow's capital stock I get is going to have to go into replacing the current capital stock before it can add to that capital stock. Just one moment. Okay, so let's do an example with this. So let's say the existing capital stock is 100, the future tomorrow's capital stock is 110, and the depreciation rate is 0.1, or 10%. When we take the law of motion of capital, like this, and we plug these guys in, that's going to tell us what investment is. 
kt plus 1 is 110 minus 1 minus 0 0.1 times 100. Well, 1 minus 0 0.1 is 0 0.9 times 100. So I get 110 minus, well, 90% of 100 is 90. Investment is 20. So investment's telling me the flow of capital over time, how much new capital is being added to the capital stock that currently exists. Conversely, let's assume for a moment Delta's 0.5. K, KT, and KT plus 1 are still going to be the same. What do we get now? Seems weird, doesn't it? Investment 60. So it looks like investment's more when the depreciation rate is higher. Wouldn't that, that that'd be good, right? Like more investment's always a good thing, but no, not necessarily. Because y equals c plus i. Let's say output is 150. In this case, Outputs 150 with a depreciation rate of 10%. 150 equals CT consumption plus investment IT, which in this case is 20. What is CT? Well, it's 150 minus 20, 130. In case two. Depreciation is 0.5. Output still 150. But now, because depreciation rate is higher, investment has to be higher, which means consumption has to fall. So here consumption is 130, here consumption is only 90. So a higher depreciation rate means we need to take some of the output that was going to be spent on consumer goods we have to purchase fewer consumer goods because we need more investment goods in order just to keep the capital stock where it is, let alone add to it. So a higher rate of depreciation means there's going to be more investment. We need to purchase more capital, which means we can consume less consumer goods or fewer consumer goods. What we are going to do, and then I will terminate this lecture, 
is list out all the equations that we've got, put them together. So what were all the equations that we had? We had GDP, we had production, we had investment, the law of motion of capital. Savings, capital S to T, multiplied or is equal to the fraction S that is saved. It's a constant fraction every period, multiplied by output, is equal to investment. So, with these four equations, we can actually begin to solve the model. How do we put these guys together? Well, how to put them together? Answer, we're gonna substitute out YT and IT, how do we do that? Well, we can see I have an equation, the first equation, equation, well, let me label these equations, it might make things easier. Equation one, equation two, equation three, and equation four. Let's not focus on equation four so much. Let's look at equations one through three. Well, equation one, as output Y, consumption C, and investment I. Equation two defines output Equation three defines investment. So really what we need to do is just take equation one and substitute it with the definitions for output and investment. So we're gonna plug Equation 2 into yt for equation 1. All right, yt is equal to a times k to the alpha times l to the 1 minus alpha, but I've got y here. So if y and y are the same, y is equal to that, and plug that in there. So I got rid, I substituted out yt. Now let's look at investment, because I want to get rid of investment too, right? Because the answer is to substitute out both output and investment. So I'm going to take equation three.
and this is what I have. Note now, I've substituted out y and i. So I now have it in terms of capital, labor, consumption, capital, and capital. And I will end the lecture here. We're about one hour and seven minutes in, so it looks like you're getting out a little early again today. Um, so we'll end here. The next lecture is going to express this thing right here, which is actually a constraint. We're going to express this constraint in per capita terms. So currently, this is an aggregate when it comes to looking at every individual, or we're including every person here, aggregated at the top, but we don't want this at the aggregate. We want this at the per person level, right? We want it to be per capita, or as it's referred to in this model, per effective labor units. And we will also discuss why it's called per effective labor units. Actually, screw it, I'll explain now, because we still have a couple minutes left. It's in effective labor units because we assume every unit of the population in this model is working. So if everybody, in the population is working, per capita is the same as per worker or per effective labor units. So with that, I will terminate this lecture and uh, you enjoy the rest of your day. And the week will conclude with putting this into per capita terms, solving out the model, and then drawing what we're actually doing mathematically. So we're going to look at both the math and the graphs to see how this stuff works. So enjoy.